It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here. My name is Michael Milde, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at Western. And it is wonderful to uh, welcome you all. Thank you. I'm one is forgetting how to use these mics. It's wonderful to welcome all of you who are here in person. It's a great pleasure to welcome people from uh, Western, of course, but also from the community here in London. And it's also wonderful to uh, welcome all the people who are joining us online. I understand we might have well over 100 people, so that is fantastic. And it, it is a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Hani and Najet Hassan lecture. And it's also important to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Anishinaabe, the Lenapawa, the uh, Haudenosaunee, and the Jonathan peoples. And these lands are subject to the treaties of Sombra and London Township of 1796, historical documents that continue to inform the lives of the people who live here, both indigenous and non-indigenous, in ways that we probably don't understand as fully as we should. And here at a university, a place of higher learning, we should make every effort to understand that history and to make the changes that are necessary to create a just society. Likewise, it's important to acknowledge that October is Islamic Heritage Month. And uh, as we know in London, we have particular cause to be concerned about the treatment of our uh, Muslim co-citizens co here in London. And uh, we want to do that by acknowledging the contributions that uh, Islamic civilization has made to Western culture and uh, culture everywhere. And I can't really do better than to draw on the terms of uh, the, the donation that has made today possible. And um, I'm just going to read this. It's, it's a lovely thing. The, the guiding principle of the lecture is that education plays an integral role in the addressing and eliminating racism and discrimination and helps foster intercultural exchanges the purpose of the lecture is to stimulate both thought and discussion with regard to the history, culture, and societies of the Islamic and Arab world and their contribution to civilization. And goes on, the lecture will be an important part of Western's commitment to advance its anti-racism objectives and to ensure that our community, our campus, our programs, our research, our outreach, and our self-representation will be more inclusive. That is. Uh, the statement that guides today's talk. And it's really a great pleasure to thank Hani Hassan, who is here in person. Hani, just put your hand up. Lots of people here know you. Thank you so much. Hani Hassan has been a friend of Western for about mm, a long time, <laughs> a really long time. And a great friend of Arts and Humanities and my friend for a, such a long time as well. And your contributions to the university are fantastic. And it is really an honor that you chose Arts and Humanities as the source uh, or the place to put your gift and to advance this great educational goal. Thank you so much. And it's, I have, I have, this is a really great gig I have because it's now my great pleasure <laughs> to introduce our outstanding speaker, the inaugural Hani Najet Hassan lecturer, uh, Ludamini Ognaiki from uh, the University of Virginia. So here's a few things you need to know about him. He got all his degrees at Harvard, he did pretty well. And he's been a visiting uh, lecturer and scholar at uh, all sorts of famous universities and now happily at our own. And he's also the author of uh, Deep Knowledge, Ways of Knowing in Sufism and Ifa, Two West African Intellectual Traditions. And the winner of the, Outst which was, sorry, that book was the winner of the Outstanding First Book Prize of the Association of the Study of Worldwide African Diaspora. And uh, he's got another book, Poetry and Praise of Prophetic Perfection, West African Mahdi Poetry and Its Precedents. Um, and there's much besides. But you can, you all have phones, you can Google that. <laughs> so I'll spare you that. And I, what I will say, which you won't find on Google, is that he's an amateur poet and a drummer. So a poet and a musician. So with that, Oganaiki, it's all uh, I mean, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. Oh. 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, us tonight, this evening. I know there are a lot of other things you could be doing on a Friday evening. So thank you for choosing to spend uh, your time with us this evening. Um, I wanted to uh, begin uh, by acknowledging the kind of tragedy um, that uh, in, in some ways occasioned this, this lecture, the tragedy of the, the, the murder of the Afzal family in, in an act of uh, anti-Muslim terrorism. And my, I, I pray that they uh, are enveloped in God's mercy in Janata Fedos, and my deepest condolences go out to them, their family, and the entire London community. And so as a kind of epigram to this lecture, I wanted to begin with this particular verse of the, of the Quran. Uh, not equal are the good, the virtuous, the beautiful, and the evil or ugly act. So repel evil or ugliness by that which is better, more virtuous, or beautiful. And then the one between whom and you enmity has intervened will be as a dear friend. And you have to excuse the rather clumsy translation here, but the Arabic term hasana here from the, the root hasana uh, means at once beauty, virtue, and goodness. And as we'll see in the lecture, in traditional Islamic thought and the Muslim mind in general, these go, very, go hand in hand. They, can, they can't really be separated and are deeply connected to truth. All right, so the title of the lecture comes from a hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, in the Allah Jamil, wa yuhibbul jamal. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. And we'll explore this a bit further. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the uh, Hassan family for their incredible generosity and the wonderful hospitality of the people at Western. Oh, sorry, if were I asked to introduce uh, Islam to an audience unfamiliar with it, as I'm kind of often asked to do as a professor of Islamic studies, I wouldn't recommend reading a book like uh, Islam for Dummies or kind of Islam for uh, basic, you know, these books that you see in, in the airport and things like that. I wouldn't recommend one of those nor would I even recommend reading a translation of an Islamic philosophical treatise or legal treatise or theological treatise um, or even a translation of the Quran. Instead, what I would recommend is what I tried and failed to do here is to just listen to uh, a beautiful recitation of the Quran untranslated. So let me try this again, see if I can get this to work. Nope, let me go back here. Or I would recommend, oops, I'm gonna have to go here, sorry. Or I would recommend listening to a beautiful recitation of poetry, such as this one from this uh, boy in Syria. That's Islam. Or looking at a beautiful illumined manuscript page of the Quran, like this one from Iran. Or if I could take you to stand underneath the dome of a beautiful mosque, like this one in Yazd, also in Iran. Or take you to an old uh, Moroccan home in Fez or Marrakesh. Now this is uh, somewhat of a, a paradox. Um, but it's because these most outward expressions of the Islamic tradition paradoxically represent the most inward, subtle, and essential realities of that tradition. And the kind of proof of this point for me is 
another paradox, which is that a, a number of societies which are filled with virulent anti-Muslim and anti-Islamic propaganda, such as in India and the Western world, so on and so forth, in these same societies, people will queue for hours to appreciate Islamic architecture like the Alhambra or the Taj Mahal, or to go listen to concerts of traditional Islamic music, or shell out money buying Rumi's books. Uh, the same exact societies. So why is this the case? Why, do, why can people appreciate Rumi but don't like Muslims? Why does everybody want to take a picture with the Taj Mahal? What's going on here? So I think this is uh, one of the best explanations I've seen of this interesting phenomenon is from this great Swiss uh, scholar of Christian and Islamic art, Titus Burkhardt, who explains, he says, just as a mental form such as a dogma or a doctrine can be an adequate, albeit limited, reflection of a divine truth, so a sensible form can retrace a truth or reality which transcends both the plane of sensible forms and the plane of thought. That is, art can allow us to express what can't be explained. Art can help us to F the ineffable, as, as, as one of my colleagues uh, said. And so for Muslims, this is why the explanation why when people, some people hear a Quranic recitation, even without understanding Arabic at all, it can produce strong emotions. People even cry when they hear the Quran without understanding any Arabic. This kind of direct experience of beauty cuts through all of these ideas, presuppositions, prejudices, other things that we have, and speaks directly to the heart and to the soul. In this way, what I and others have called the silent theology of Islamic art, I believe speaks more profoundly and clearly than any polemical or discursive argument. And this is nicely illustrated and uh, kind of said, encapsulated in a verse by the great Egyptian poet Ibn al-Farid, who writes, which is impossible to translate, but it's, it's kind of like um, how often the masters of dispute um, uh, master of argument dispute with one another, while among the lovers of beauty, there's no dispute. Beauty has this amazing power to bring us together, to, to pull us together. And engaging in things in an aesthetic mode, as opposed to an argumentative mode, brings out different kinds of engagement and different things become possible. It's almost, beauty has sometimes even been said to be a universal language. From the traditional Islamic perspective, this is because God is beautiful, and God is one. And so that beauty is the, and, and the harmony uh, are the reflection of divine unity in the realm of multiplicity and diversity. And we'll return to this point a bit later on. In fact, uh, another great eminent scholar of Islamic art, oh yes, uh, Sayyid Hossein Nas, has defined Islamic art, the whole tradition, as the manifestation in the world of forms of the spiritual realities of the Islamic revelation itself. Now this is distinguished from Muslim art, just art that Muslims do. So the popular singer Zayn Malik or the rapper Ice Cube, they're Muslims, but their music isn't necessarily Islamic. Conversely, non-Muslims can learn Islamic calligraphy. In fact, now King Charles, uh, then Prince, had uh, established a school for traditional arts, and among the things taught there were traditional Islamic architecture, uh, calligraphy, geometric design, in which anyone from any background could learn these things. But what makes it Islamic art are the principles behind it. Um, so what Islamic art does is it brings these, or attempts to bring these super sensible realities, these spiritual realities into the sensible world and to serve as a mirror of the unseen, as it's often called in classical texts. And this is kind of like a false color images that you may have seen, these astronomical pictures, right? So they take things that we can't see normally uh, things in ultraviolet radiation, gamma radiation, other things like that. And through a process of encoding and representation, they make it tangible to us. All right, so what uh, these uh, astronomers and astro artists do and what some of these radio telescopes do in a certain way is uh, analogous to what the Islamic arts try to do. They try to make the invisible world visible and tangible to us in order to give us a direct experience of the sacred. Uh, again, turning to another poem that kind of embodies this, the famous poet Jalaluddin Rumi has this great poem that says, Mutrebe Agazid Pisha Torke Mast, Dar Hijabe Nogme, Asrare Alast. So as the musician began to play before the drunken Turk, behind the veil of melody, the secrets of Alast. Now, Alast refers to this idea in kind of Quranic mythology that all of us, before we came to, into this world, God gathered us and together and said, Alastu Bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? 
And we all said, Bella, shehidna, yes, we bear witness. And this kind of initial call and response is, is very important in the theories of Islamakar that you find in classical texts. Um, but the idea here is that the drunken Turk, one of the ways you can interpret this verse, is that the drunken Turk represents somebody drowned in forgetfulness, literally out of his or her mind, out of his or her mind, forgetfulness of uh, his or her true nature, of, of reality, kind of drunk and out of it. And the musician is playing this uh, through, through the music, is reminding this person of who he or she really is, of the divine home and their origin. Now these invisible, intangible realities are made apparent through the veil of melody. What does he mean by veil of melody? If there's something invisible, like there were an invisible man running around here causing mischief, and I wanted to see him, or catch him, you throw a blanket on him, take the scarf on him, and then even though it's a veil and it's hiding, it's also revealing the contours. Right, so this is how the Islamic arts have been traditionally understood as a kind of veil of melody, as something that reveals the invisible, that makes tangible the invisible spiritual realities. They bring these realities of the unseen world, the alam al-ghayb, in Islamic terms, into the sensible world, the alam al-shahada. So to give you a historical example of this, so it's, I'm not just talking about Muslims experiencing art like this, uh, the famous uh, genius mathematician, physicist John von Neumann, uh, American Hungarian, was taken on a tour of Iran with a number of other prominent intellectuals, and they went to a mosque in Isfahan. And as they were entering the mosque, von Neumann stood outside, rooted to the spot, while everybody else went in on the tour. And he stayed there for a full hour while everybody else completed the whole tour. And when they came back, they asked him, What's going on? Are you all right? Why didn't you come on the tour? And he said, Never before have I seen the world of mathematics with my own eyes. So Van Norman, this genius who spent his whole life in this world of mathematics, when confronted by these kind of geometric patterns and designs in Isfahan, said, this is the world of mathematics. This is what I've been living in. I've never before seen it made tangible like this uh, before. Uh, so this, again, shows this connection between the Islamic arts and the connection to the truth. The idea is you're not just representing or presenting anything that you just come up with in your head, but there's an idea that this, these realities in a kind of platonic sense exist and they're represented. And as Plato said, and it's taken very seriously in the Islamic tradition, beauty is the splendor of the true. And the expression of the truth in the Islamic world traditionally is always connected with beauty. The Quran is the manifestation of the truth par excellence for, uh, in, tr in traditional Islamic civilization and it's always recited beautifully. It's even a religious prescription. You're supposed to beautify the recitation of the Quran with your voices. So this is tight connection between goodness, beauty, and truth. Now, this is not true of all philosophies of art. You have all kinds of different philosophies, art for art's sake, kind of decadence movement, all these other different things. But for Islamic art, it has a particular philosophy. Uh, just like all art, all art assumes a cosmology, uh, a kind of philosophy of space and time, a metaphysics, what's an idea of what's real, what's not, anthropology, who we are as human beings, what our place in the world is, what our function is, what our goal is. And this all informs the aesthetics and e ethics of particular art traditions. That is, what's beautiful, what's good, and why. So every choice that an artist makes, whether or not he or she realizes it, is guided by these ideals and ideas. And so are an audience's perception and reception of this art. Different people coming from different backgrounds can understand art in, in very different ways. So the specific nature of Islamic cosmology, derived from the Quran, from the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet, and the vision of reality that results from trying to live this out in the different traditions that have emerged from that, means that Islamic art takes on specific kinds of forms uh, based on these specific worldviews and cosmologies. Now, I can't give a comprehensive overview of Islamic cosmology here. I can just try to give you a little taste of some ideas that are relevant to uh, what we're going to talk about today. So one of the most important doctrines that you'll find in a lot of classical sources is that of the three books, the three books of the world, of revelation, and the human soul. And the idea is that God, the metacosm, the absolute, the real, is so transcendent in his oneness that he can't be contemplated directly. God's oneness doesn't admit of the duality of subject and object, which is necessary for contemplation. However, everything that exists in the world and within us as human beings are manifestations of the qualities of this divine reality, of the divine, of the sacred. And so God creates the book of the world called the created book, Kitab uh, uh, Taqwini, the human book 
uh, the personal book, and then also sends down scripture, which is a kind of key to unlock the mysteries of both. Now, the, um, the Quran being, for Muslims, the example of the scripture par excellence, all of its verses are called ayat, which means signs. And among these, in these verses, many verses describe everything in the cosmos also as ayat. That is signs reflecting God's names and qualities. So everything that exists are kind of like mirrors, like divine self-portraits, mirrors pointing back to God. And then everything within us as human beings being a particular special kind of creation, a, a book that, that summarizes everything as well, also contains these ayat. And the, the ayat of the Quran, the verses, are the keys to interpreting and understanding the relationship amongst these different ayats, and through them understanding the divine reality. You can see this in a verse of the Quran that's uh, from Surah Fusilat that says, we'll show them our signs on the horizons and in themselves until these signs here being ayat, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. So there's a metacosm, which is mirrored or reflected in the macrocosm, the microcosm, and then scripture provides its kind of key to unlocking the significance and connections among them. There's another famous, is this working? Oops. Apologies. It's another famous poem uh, by the early Islamic poet Labid. Uh, in everything there is a sign that indicates that he is one or that points to the one. So everything in the world is understood as ayat, as particular forms of the formless, that which is beyond form, that reflect and lead back to uh, beyond form, back to the divine. Okay. Now, there's an interesting corollary of this perspective. Since everything is an ayat, is a sign of God, um, and God is beautiful, everything is beautiful. In fact, there's a hadith in which uh, the Prophet said, Katab Allahu ihsan ala kulli shay. God inscribed beauty, excellence, perfection upon everything. Now, this is particularly true of nature, which is God's direct creation. Right? So there are other things, these buildings, God makes us, we make these buildings. Right? So in that kind of game of telephone or something like that, things can get a little messy, right? But God's direct creation is always beautiful. I mean, we can even see this. It's hard to take, see a, a picture of a landscape that's just, quote unquote, virgin nature and say, oh, that's ugly. You ever seen an ugly mountain or an ugly ocean or an ugly sunset? It's, it's, it's not really the way we kind of think about these things. Um, and a lot of the traditional societies that live more in harmony with nature, uh, things are characterized by beauty traditional Islamic societies, but also others. Very rarely do you see the, the cups that people use, the clothes that they use. It's, it's very hard to find an ugly building, an ugly pre-modern building. Right? Whereas today, we've got parking garages, we've got strip malls, we've got, and this is not just, not just the Western world. Muslim world has ugly buildings that will compete with anybody in, in, terms, of, in, term, in terms of ugliness. Um, but this, uh, this emphasis on nature and, and the beauty of nature, which is very much in the Quran, it's meant that a lot of the Islamic arts uh, were described by some of the early practitioners as being a kind of compensation for urban dwellers leaving the beauty of nature. And what they tended to do was to take natural forms and abstract them kind of geometrically. So, uh, for example, one thing that's pointed out is that the, the ro geometric rosettes that you see, they're so characteristic of much of is Islamic art, look very much like the view when you're sitting under a palm tree and you look up, the different things coming out of there. So it's kind of that natural form abstracted to a kind of geometric archetype. Also, traditional Islamic arts tended, not always, but tended to try to emphasize harmony with their surroundings, with, with the natural world. So this very clearly in the great mosque of Jene in Mali, which literally rises up from the earth around this, completely continuous with the earth around it, like the ant hills in that region or in the incredible, uh, in the Alhambra uh, as well. There's these incredible things I notice when I visit in the Generalife, um, this garden outside, they have these incredible hanging fern patterns, which are mirrored almost precisely in these structures you can see up there, I hope it's big enough for you to see, called Mukaranas. And in the, the dome in this hall of the, the two sisters there, you have the same kind of structure, the same kind of fern structure, but then abstracted. And then the Alhambra itself, famously and beautifully, really fits gorgeously into the landscape around it. Even the colors of the stone used, the form, it really has a nice harmony with its, with its surroundings. Or another wonderful example is this Iranian town of Yazd, 
which again is a mixture of wonderful mixture of adobe and turquoise, which not only represents the union of heaven and earth, but matches the sky and the earth uh, that, that you see there and, and blends in very well. Um, so a corollary of this uh, kind of perspective of God being beautiful and loving beauty is kind of contrapositively, beauty is a kind of criterion of Islamic authenticity and sacrality. And thus the ugliness of our modern cities, and this is kind of everywhere in the world, and environments is kind of a testament to how to, out of balance and harmony uh, our societies have become, and in some ways even how evil they've become. Even if we you know, kind of outsource the, the ugliness to the floating islands of plastic bottles in the Pacific, something like the fact that our societies are producing so much that is ugly is a cause for concern. That should be a warning signal to us. Um, so in, in any event, coming back to this now, as the example of truth uh, kind of par excellence, the Quran, this collection of ayat, uh, in both its content and structure have deeply shaped the form of the Islamic arts. And one way you can see this is because the Islamic revelation takes the form of a recitation or a book, the highest and most important and sacred arts in the Islamic tradition are Quranic recitation and calligraphy, those things having to do with the kind of revelation. Now you can compare this to Christianity and kind of the Western world in general, which is, represents the perspective of the word made flesh. Right? And so the highest arts are usually those depicting that divine God, human, so painting and sculpture. Right? So you go to a Western museum, it's full of, in fact, even when you say art, if you say art in a Western context, people think visual art immediately. Whereas if you say art in another context, people might think music or dance. Right? It's kind of deep civilizational uh, legacies. Um, so if, if, let's say, you were to teleport somebody from a traditional Muslim world to a contemporary museum, they say, where's the calligraphy? Why don't you have anybody chanting your psalms? This would be expected. And kind of interestingly, when the British were going around in Iran and Central Asia acquiring uh, works of art in, in various ways, they took an inordinate number of Persian miniatures leaving behind other great works of calligraphy and other things. Like, in fact, a lot of the, if you were to take, have a map of like all of the greatest Persian miniatures in, in the world produced, they're mostly centered around London, like within a 100 mile radius of, 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 of London. Um, so the, the, in this way, the, the, the very form of the revelations influenced the Islamic arts, but e even in, in kind of more detailed ways. So because this, again, because this revelation is, is a book or recitation, um, and in the Quran itself, God is described as creating things metaphorically through writing, through language. God has the pen, God creates through the pen. God writes all of existence. Or God speaks things into existence. Or, so things are either created through language or through number. Quran describes God as creating everything biqadran, with measure, with, with number. And this explains for some reason, the, uh, for certain reasons why the Islamic civilization has spent so much time and effort focusing on the sciences of language and number and mathematics. These are kind of the archetypes that are understood to uh, explain or kind of describe the whole uh, world. And they're kind of ultimately equivalent through the system known as abjad. Like a lot of ancient languages, Arabic, all letters have numerical equivalents, all numbers have uh, letter equivalents. So every number, every shape has a kind of letter equivalent and then every word has a numeric, you can add up the letters and you get a num numerical equivalent. And people love to do that, particularly in classical sources and there are all kinds of cool things you can find out architecturally. Uh, so things can be spelled out architecturally just by the geometry and the proportions there. Um, so anyway, this is the deep reason beside the uh, kind of contested prescription on figurative representation. So sometimes you'll see in more popular sources, people say, oh, why do Muslims do all this geometry Stuff. Oh, it's because they couldn't draw pictures. I assume kind of Western normativity. Everybody wants to draw pictures of people. And because they, couldn't, because they weren't allowed to draw pictures, they wanted to, but they couldn't. So that's why they did all these geometric patterns. I don't think that's the real uh, reason. I, I th there are also wonderful figural representations in Islamic art, Persian miniatures being the greatest. Um, but the deep reason for what some people call an iconism, but what, which I prefer to call a kind of hyper iconism, is this tendency to represent things in their archetypal realities of letter and number. So instead of drawing a picture of a person, you'll, have calligraphy, you'll represent that person in, for example, the prophet, in uh, language, in letter, in description, in poetry, and things like that. Or even in number, in geometric forms. So instead of copying or Im imitating the images of, of things, creating a, a kind of, doing kind of mimesis, it's they're interested in a mimesis of a higher order, 
of imitating or representing the kind of archetypal reality of the thing, what in Quranic terms is called the malakut. So I think this is, this is a, a deeper under reason for the, the kind of nature of Islamic art. Now, so as I mentioned, the Islamic art really focuses on language and, and, and mathematics letter. And so you can analyze Islamic art and break it up into language in time, number in time, language in space, and number in space. So Quranic recitation uh, combines uh, language. It's, it's kind of the highest art of language in time. It's a recitation. But it combines, uh, the recitation is always, almost always musical, and music is the experience of number in time, of proportion in time. Both harmony and melody are based upon uh, proportions in time. And this recitation, the beautiful recitations, governed by all kinds of rules, um, are understood in the tradition to bring the actual meaning of the Quran closer to us and to bring us closer to the Quran. Interestingly, even the structure of musical modes in some classical texts have been compared to structures of the Quran. You begin and end on the same note like a lot of chapters of the Quran do, the certain repeated motifs um, and other things like that, and pr proportionality. Um, as we heard before, very closely connected to the, the art of Quranic recitations, the art of poetry, which tr traditionally was sung. It's heavily metered and rhymed, and most Islamic poetry is a kind of echo of the Quran. In fact, you could say er all Arabic poetry after the Quran is, is a kind of echo of the Quran. Even Ed Edward Said, the great Christian uh, Arab scholar, said this. Um, and the function of Islamic poetry, particularly Sufi poetry, which is very popular, is to make these connections between these different ayat clear, between the signs of God in the cosmos, in our soul, and their description in, in the Quran. And it teaches us, poetry teaches us kind of how to engage with these signs, how to read them. In reading, learning how to read poetry, things would have multiple levels of meaning, different verses can mean different things in different contexts. This way of reading and engaging with things is very different from the way you read, let's say, an engineering textbook. Right? And so this kind of poetic mode of engagement has traditionally been very important in the cultivation of uh, not just Islamic arts, but society, character, what's called adab. Now calligraphy, turning to the art of calligraphy, calligraphy puts the, the revelation into space, and into space which is governed by number, governed by geometry. So let's, oh, oh sorry, this, all right. So you can see most, uh, over very quickly, different calligraphic scripts developed for writing the Quran, all with very precise rules of the proportions of different letters uh, to each other. And so this puts the, the revelation into the Arabic language, into, um, into a space uh, governed by numerical uh, proportions. Um, now, the, the actual art of calligraphy itself is used in a lot of spiritual, different spiritual practices in terms of visualization, and even the practice of calligraphy is itself a kind of meditative practice. Uh, these kind of treatises of calligraphy and calligraphic writing emerged in the Ottoman Empire describe connections that exist between the hand and the heart. As you write from right to left, your hand moves closer to your heart, and it's a kind of meditative act, um, and devotional act as well, too. And calligraphy is closely related to another art, spatial art, that of architecture. Uh, and architecture, which is you know, number in space governed by geometric uh, proportions, is described in a lot of classical Islamic texts as this Islamic architecture is the space in which the revelation reverberates. Or in other things, it's not limited to the Islamic tradition, but architecture is described as a kind of frozen music because it's based on the same proportionality of, of, of music but frozen in time. Now, particular, the number of uh, interesting particularities of Islamic architecture, but one of the most interesting is the significance of the void. So if you ever go into a mosque, particularly compared to a cathedral, or a great example of this, you go to the mosque in Cordoba, in which right in the middle, there's a kind of cathedral type structure. You can see, tell it comes from a different universe. So in the mosque, there's, a big, there's always a big void. There are no chairs, no place to sit. There's just empty, open space. And this void is important in a lot of Islamic arts, but particularly in architecture. And the void is a kind of um, a presence in absence. So the kind of peace that gets created when you walk into a mosque, the whole sound system changes because of this vast, empty, empty space, is designed to kind of be 
uh, make tangible this sakina, this piece of the, the sacred presence of, 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 of the divine. And the mosques are designed to hopefully be a foretaste of the peace of, of, of paradise. Mosques also have, are filled with, and not just mosques, but um, homes and other things are fill, of Islamic architecture, are filled with cosmological symbolism. It will take a little bit too long to get into all of the details of that here, but one quick thing that you can notice in a lot of places is that many buildings have a square base, an octagonal uh, middle, and then a dome on top. The dome represents heaven, the realm of the divine. The square base represents the earth, four corners, four elements, all of these things. And the octagonal uh, kind of boundary between the two of them represents the divine throne. In the Quran, the divine throne is described as being carried by eight angels. And so you'll often see these eight-pointed stars on roofs. In the Taj Mahal here, you see a square base, a kind of octagonal um, structure, and then the dome. And interestingly, in the Dome of the Rock, the Qubut al-Sakhra in, in, in Jerusalem, it starts with the octagonal base. Why? Because this is the place where Muslims believe the Prophet ascended directly into heaven. So you're already starting from that place, ascending straight, straight to the heavens. But this, this kind of... Um, this kind of geometric symbolism you find often in geometric designs as, as well too, which um, are, are kind of visual. If you could take the way the Quran sounds and put it in space, it looks like these geometric designs. In fact, most of these geometric designs, the earliest historical examples we have of them are illuminated pages, Quranic illumination. Right? So it's a way in which Muslims try to depict the sound of the Quran. They describe the kind of Quranic worldview, which the Quran says in Surah Mulk describes creation as being uh, created in seven heavens with no gaps, with perfection. And you kind of see this. And now another interesting way in which it's related to the Quran is the Quran has this curious quality in Muslim devotional life. You, the Quran has a kind of omnipresent center. So when Muslims recite the Quran in their daily prayers. Uh, we can start anywhere. You can start and, and recite the Quran anywhere and you can stop anywhere. Um, and this kind of omnipresent center you can see in these uh, geometric uh, patterns and, and designs. There's a lot more going on in these ge geometric patterns and designs, but for the sake of time, I just want to talk briefly about these other two modes of the Islamic arts. So famous poet uh, Abu Ala al-Ma'ari, Syrian poet, said, beauty splendor appears in two things, a tent, uh, a verse of poetry, baytin min al-shi'ri, or a tent of hair, baytin min al-sha'ar. Um, Sha'ar and Shir are coming from the same root, but meaning poetry and, and, and hair. And this was used to divide the Islamic arts into the arts of adab, or poetry, that I mentioned before, and kind of literature, belles lettres, um, and those of ambiance. Now, adab is a term that's impossible to translate in English, but it means kind of at once belles lettres, poetry, but also good manners, comportment, civilization, culture, and these kinds of things. And it's through these arts of poetry, of uh, literature that people became cultured. And this wasn't just for elites. Illiterate people, uh, up until very recently, pretty much just this, this uh, like our grandparents' generation, could recite poems for hours and hours and hours, pretty much everywhere throughout the Muslim world. And it was through this poetry that people learned a lot of their ethics, a lot of their manners. Um, in fact, one Indian uh, ruler in India said, we, Muslim ruler in India said, we lost our culture when the British banned Persian and we stopped teaching the Golestan of Saadi one of these great classics of Western literature, of, of Islamic literature. Now, the arts of ambiance, architecture, design, even clothing, um, I won't have time to get into all the cool things about clothing, uh, also shape our, our, our characters, also shape our personalities, also shape uh, us in very profound ways um, as, as well, too. Now, all of these arts, whether of adab or of ambiance, um, are designed to serve the highest art, which is the art of the remembrance of God and the cultivation of good character. There's another hadith in which the Prophet said, I was sent only to cultivate beautiful character, husn al-akhlaq. So this is the kind of highest art, which all of these other Islamic arts are meant to serve. So as a design theorist Clive Dilno uh, wrote, first we make things not only in order to make things as such, that is things in themselves, but to make a world, a particular kind of world, in which we can be particular kinds of human beings. For how we can be as human beings is dependent in large part on the kinds of human worlds that we make. Right? That is, for centuries, for over millennia, the Islamic arts have strove, striven to create particular kinds of beautiful worlds in order to shape a particular form of, or particular forms of, 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 of beautiful character. 
And if this sounds very abstract, I mean, think horror movies, bad things always happen when you're in a parking garage. That ambiance, it just feels terrible. There's a reason why that happens, right? Or I said, as I wrote in another essay, when soldiers or criminals are pumping themselves up to commit acts of violence, unless they're really out there, they're not listening to Bach, right? They're listening to metal, you know, that, that kind of gets you in the, so these, this ambiance really does have profound effects on us, especially over time, over generations. Uh, this, this really does, these arts really do shape who we are, how we engage with the world. In the words of another uh, traditional theorist uh, of art, uh, early 20th century South Asian, Ananda Komaswamy, said, look, in traditional societies, the artist was not a special kind of man, but every man and woman, I'll add, was a special kind of artist. In traditional civilizations like the Islamic, uh, these arts and the divine art of nature were for everybody, not just for the rich, not just for the elites. Uh, and beauty is not a luxury, nor should it be a luxury. Uh, I think our souls need beauty just as our bodies need air, food, and water. And just as our bodies kind of become what we eat, our, our souls are kind of who we are, become what we look at, what we listen to, what we consume in the sense of consuming media. And so neglecting the arts, Islamic or otherwise, I think, has had and will continue to have a very detrimental effect uh, uh, upon our souls, upon us as, as human beings, Muslim and non. Now, to understand the central importance of the Islamic arts within the tradition and the kind of full disaster of their, the attack on the Islamic arts and their post-colonial neglect, it's enough to think about the term ihsan. Um, which means at once excellence, beauty, and perfection, like I said. Now, the famous ihsan is defined in this famous uh, hadith saying of the prophet, um, in, the angel, in which the angel Gabriel comes to him and defines Islam as performing the five pillars, pray five times a day, go on hajj, fast, etc. Defines iman or belief in terms of these six articles of faith, and defines ihsan as worshiping God as if you see him, for if you don't see him, he sees you. Now, the as if is key here. It's this kind of as if is imagination that the Islamic arts are all based on. Beautiful architecture, beautiful calligraphy, beautiful carpets, beautiful geometric design allows us to worship God as if we're seeing him, as we're seeing his beauty in these ayat of these wonderful art forms that reflect his beauty. And this beauty is really important because beauty always provokes love. In the Islamic tradition, Platonic tradition, almost any tradition that I know, beauty and love are in inseparable. Um, and love is uh, essential to sincerity. All right. So, and sincerity, yeah, so, and there are loads of hadith that say something like, none of you actually believe and none of you are actually Muslims until you love God more than your wealth, than your children, than your, even yourselves. Um, and apart from love, any other intention uh, is kind of tainted with some, some sort of self-interest. Right? So it's only through beauty and through love uh, that we can achieve a form of sincerity. And the Quran even says this, beauty or virtue is its own reward. There's a verse in Surah Rahman that says, is the reward for ihsan anything other than ihsan? Or to paraphrase uh, my favorite poet of all time, Hafez, a uh, kind of twisted English translation to make it rhyme, apart from lovers, all I see is self-righteous hypocrisy. Right? So when we get rid of the arts, when we get rid of these, this, pers this aesthetic perspective, um, we undermine uh, love and we undermine uh, sincerity. And then all we're left with is kind of the shell of hypocrisy, which doesn't serve anyone very well. So in conclusion, thank you for sticking with me so long. Uh, I'd like to argue or rather invite you to consider the Islamic arts as windows or doors through which we can access the deepest truths of the cosmos, of the revelation, and of ourselves. And the kind of loss of the Islamic arts for many different reasons in, in the Muslim world and, and elsewhere is also, I believe, deeply connected to the rise of extreme sectarianism and the overall difficulty of perceiving unity and diversity. That doesn't just reflect the Muslim world today, but I don't think there's ever been a more homogenizing period in humanity. We're losing languages as fast as we're losing species. Um, in the hierarchy of traditional Islamic cosmology and metaphysics, because God is one, as one approaches this kind of divine presence, things become more unified and united and harmonious. And so those without access to this unity 
and this, and again, in this perspective, the Islamic arts kind of serve as a bridge to this unity, uh, are unable to perceive and participate in this harmony, in this reflection of unity in multiplicity. Uh, this harmony that links the world of appearances to those of realities. So the Islamic arts can serve as bridges to unite these worlds of appearances of reality, of unity and multiplicity, and help us cross over from outward multiplicity to realize inward unity, while still preserving both formal diversity and superformal unity. And this has been really important in the ways in which Islamic art has influenced other artistic traditions and been influenced by other artistic traditions. Usually at its root, there's a recognition of some kind of common core principles that are then adopted and taken into Islamic art or adopted from Islamic art and taken into uh, Western art cathedrals, for example, massively influenced by uh, Moroccan Andalusian architecture, even stained glass uh, things. Um, a, a wonderful example of this is Hindustani classical music. Right, so most people, the most famous of the past century artists of Hindustani classical music is Ravi Shankar. Right? Anyone know who his teacher was, who his guru was? His name was Ustad Alaraka, the Muslim. Hindustani classical music has been as influenced by Islam and Islamic philosophy and perspectives on art as it has been uh, Vedic traditions of, of music. And this kind of mutual recognition of fundamental principles while still preserving diversity and difference on the formal level is what allowed this beautiful uh, kind of syn synthesis and synergy of cultures in the, in the aesthetic uh, realm and even sometimes in the spiritual uh, realm to, to, to happen. So I'd argue that or suggest or invite us to consider that if we view being Muslim, but really just being human, being a good person as an art, as a craft of purifying our hearts, of striving to know the truth, of beautifying our character, rather than as a kind of fixed identity, we can understand how different approaches can lead to the same or a similar goal. Uh, thus, I believe this recent epidemic of accusations of infidelity of all kinds, not just religious, political, and all, all sorts of other things, from all corners could be ameliorate, ameliorated by the understanding of the practice of being human, of being a good person as an art form, uh, a cultivation of love and conformity to beauty, instead of focusing on an either-or notion of identity. So while many have attempted to reduce the Islamic tradition to a list of do's and don'ts in the realm of behavior and belief, I believe the Islamic, the Islamic artistic tradition provides a powerful reminder of the more profound realities of the tradition and the purpose of the, Islam the entire Islamic tradition itself, which is the highest art of bringing the human soul back to its fitra, its beautiful original nature, which perfectly reflects all of the divine names and qualities, both the Jalal, the majestic, and the Jamal, the beautiful. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Odamini, for such a beautiful talk, <laughs> truly. And yes, we do have a few minutes to uh, ask some questions. Uh, given the technology that we have to use, I would ask you to put your hand up, say your question. I will repeat it so that the people who are on live stream might actually hear it. So any questions? Patrick. Yes. Yes. That is all you need to know. All you know. Yep. So let me just translate that for our audience here, which is uh, this gentleman was uh, transported back to undergraduate days and studying Keats where truth is beauty and beauty is truth and connects to what Holden was talking about. Yes. So there's actually an interesting, there's an ahistorical thing, so the saying very much the same thing. There's also an interesting historical connection there as well too. So Keats and the Romantic poets were themselves heavily influenced by the German Romantic movement, which Goethe was kind of the father of. And Goethe was obsessed with Hafez, my favorite poet. His last work, the East Aust uh, West Ostensor Divan, was devoted to Hafez. Goethe himself was a kind of amateur student of Persian and Sufism, and so was exposed to a lot of these ideas. 
there as well. Now another common source of influence historically, there is a kind of Neoplatonic tradition which was taken up very avidly in the Islamic and Neopath uh, Neoplatonic and Neopythagorean tradition which was kind of mainstream, particularly in the field of uh, Islamic arts and Islamic artists and those writing uh, about it as well too, which was all, Coleridge was a big uh, student of the Neoplatonic uh, tradition and very moved by that. And so the Romantic movement itself has a lot of these affinities, but then also through Goethe and others, um, and the American romantics are sometimes called the Cambridge Persians because they read a lot of Persian Sufi poetry. So there's this kind of both a historical affinity with Neoplatonism, but then also these direct historical influences of uh, the perspectives I'm presenting here and the, uh, the you know, on, on, on the poets like Keats. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick. Yes. The importance of copying. Okay. So, yeah, the question was uh, as a printmaker, Patrick is wondering about the effect of copying because it, in various art forms it, the copying part is an important aspect of, the, of what's, at, what's at stake. Yes, so in the traditional crafts, copying is kind of everything. So the poetry is one of the traditions I, I know the best. Um, and the way you become a poet traditionally is by memorizing, they say you have to memorize first 10,000 verses of poetry, then you have to forget 5,000 of them um, but in addition to memorizing these great classics, another thing that is commonly done is you write what are called mu'aradas, which are kind of response poems in the same style. In the, so you do something kind of in the same style, in the same meter, with the same rhyme. And you do this for all of the classics to kind of test out your skills. So like Miles Davis said, it takes a long time to learn how to play like yourself. And the way you do that is you, you play like the greats, and you copy them and you imitate, and in doing so, then you have little additions, little subtractions, until through that you can kind of develop your own voice and your own style. And poetry very much works like that. In other Islamic arts as well, too, it works like that. That's how you train, that's how you learn. Um, but there's, uh, depending on the tradition, there's significant degrees of creativity and freedom kind of once you've mastered that. But before you've mastered it, if you're just trying to do something, as you know, discipline builds freedom. Like gymnasts and break dancers can do all kinds of things with their bodies that most of us couldn't dream of doing because they put in the time and effort doing these discipline exercise and practice. So this, this kind of discipline of mastering a tradition, uh, mastering a form, in many ways can give you more freedom. Because most of us, when you think we're being free and just doing whatever we want, we're just kind of doing one or two forms. I, like, I use dancing with my students. I'm like, if I just told you to dance right now, you just do one of the two TikTok tans dances you saw most recently, but if you were a trained dancer and had mastered several different forms, you'd have a lot more freedom of movement. And it very much, the, the craft education in the Islamic tradition is very, very similarly structured upon that. Okay, that's gonna be a tough one too. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the contrast is between uh, Islamic art and art that is created by Muslim artists. And so is it the religion that informs the art or is it the culture of the artist which then creates the artwork? Over to you. <laughs> yeah, I think you can't really separate the culture from the religion. The religion determines so many things in the culture, how you say hello, the words in the language, the structure of how all of this stuff is shaped by uh, religion. And, and so I don't think you can really separate our culture and religion. Um, now, interestingly, I mean, we have examples of classical Islamic civilization of non-Muslims doing Islamic art. So Mimar Sinan, this famous architect of a lot of the greatest mosques, and he was originally Christian. He built some mosques while he was still Christian and then converted, right? But the principles that he was using, the, the, the scrolls that he was working from, the design plans and, and things like that, um, in some cases we have very clear written records of the philosophies that they're, of, of art that they're coming from are clearly Islamic, clearly influenced by the Quran. Um, and in other cases there are these oral traditions that still exist today. So for example, the mud mosque of Jenne. Uh, that, that I showed you there, bears some resemblance to pre-Islamic structures, no doubt. That's, what that's kind of the, the material they're taking from, but they adapted it in certain ways. 
and there's an oral tradition as to how they make the mosque and the way the, the proportions of the mosque have to be that are related to the proportions of uh, distances between astronomical bodies and things like that too, that are coming from a general kind of Islamic cosmological worldview. Now this general Islamic cosmological worldview uh, wasn't, it wasn't just Muslims who lived in that kind of universe and thought in, 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 in those ways. So you have Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and others who are part of that kind of general world. Just as today, you know, exist in the, you have, you have Muslims in a kind of Christian world, a Christian space, a post-Christian space, if, if you want to call it. People are influenced by the ideas of the metaphysics, the cosmology, or what makes something good art or bad, what's going to get the most hits on YouTube or not, uh, th things like that. Um, and so the, the particular identity of the artist. Now there are certain cases in which you have certain forms that uh, artists themselves said were inspired to them or revealed in kind of mystical visions or things like that, which then later people copy. So there's a famous 19th century uh, Moroccan calligrapher, Al Qandusi, who's one of my favorite. He has this very strange calligraphic style, but I, I really like it, it's very unique. And he said this was revealed to him in a vision by the Prophet. Right, so it's very, that's very clearly you know, Islamic spirituality going there. But uh, I have uh, in my art, uh, in some of my classes, I have students copy Qandusi style or try to imitate Qandusi style. And they don't have to be Muslim in order to do that. Great question. OK, so in the notion of calligraphy in architecture, uh, sometimes the, the calligrapher is referred to as the great, which suggests a certain hierarchy. And so the question is, can everybody do this, or is there sort of a, an order? Yes, so there is um, so different traditions of art. So there are different kind of guilds that are kind of traditions that form. So there's an Ottoman, there's an early Ottoman, and then there are several late Ottoman traditions. So in Islamic civilization in general, teaching works on this uh, system based on isnad, so a kind of chain of transmission. So when you learn the Qur'an, you learn it from somebody, you learn it from somebody, you learn it from somebody, you learn it from the Prophet. If you learn hadith sayings of the Prophet, these chains of tra transmission go back. And this kind of uh, idea and methodology is kind of seeped into all the different arts and, and, and sciences. So m master calligraphers, any uh, kind of traditionally trained calligrapher, will have a master who had a master who had a master going back. So you have a particular lineage uh, that you're a part of. And so different lineages, uh, when, when you've kind of mastered when your teacher says, okay, you've mastered this script, or you've mastered this style, or you've mastered this technique, then he'll grant you what's called an ijazah, kind of testification that you have mastered this and you now have permission to, to teach this. So certain people have collected, let's say, a number of ijazahs from the greatest uh, calligraphers or greatest artists in different styles. Uh, so there's, for example, an American uh, calligrapher, Mohammed Zakaria, who studied in, uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, with one of the, regarded as one of the 20th century's greatest calligraphers, and he has an ijazah for him, from him in certain scripts. And so he's now regarded as a master in, in, his, in his own right. So this, this, kind, of, this, this kind of hierarchy uh, exists. You have masters, and you have the kind of different grades of mastership, masterhood, uh, that you can achieve through studying and then being recognized by someone for your skills and your mastery of the tradition. Oh, no, sorry, the orthodox painters. Um, depends on the teacher. So some teachers, some teachers would only teach Muslim students. Some teachers would teach anybody. Um, and I think it's, it's related to orthodox, because orthodox iconography also has very, very strict rules of geometric proportions. And you're not trying to represent, let's say, how the Virgin Mary looked, but you're rather trying to evoke a kind of spiritual presence or a spiritual archetype. The, 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 you can actually see this in, um, uh, compare orthodox icons to post-Renaissance uh, iconography. Post-Renaissance iconography is kind of very real, almost photorealistic, whereas the orthodox icons continue to be kind of more archetypal. They're not trying to look like a, like a, you know, a person in Florence or in Russia or in Greece. Uh, you know, they, have, they have strange kind of rectangular hands and things like that. So it, it's meant to kind of be a depiction of an archetype rather than a, a kind of more naturalistic depiction. Another hard one to put on for the video. So uh, the connections were made between art and the Quran, right? And uh, the inspiration and the, the back and forth between those elements. But the question is, well, before the Quran was revealed um, to the Prophet, then what was it that built up Islamic, Islamic art? art. Yeah. 
So two ways of answering this question. One, there's no Islamic art before the Quran. Islamic art comes from the Quran, so that's kind of easy. Now, the, it also depends on what you mean by Islam. So in the Quranic perspective, Islam is this kind of has multiple layers of meaning. It just means submission to God. So in one sense of the meaning of Islam, everything is Islam. Everything's a Muslim. Everything submits to God. The stars, this podium is a, is a Muslim, everything. Then there's a kind of more restricted sense, which is those who submit to God's will by following one of his 124,000 prophets sent to every community amongst mankind. So anybody who follows guidance of any prophet or religious figure or sage is a Muslim. And so taking that meaning of Islam, then uh, you have these elements of, let's say, Sassanid uh, architecture of Byzantine uh, architecture and art and things like that that are informed from the Islamic perspective by their revelations, from their, you know, they're informed by their own cosmologies. And what uh, Islam then, in the more restrictive meaning of those people who kind of try to submit to God's will by following the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran and these kinds of things. When, Islamic, when Muslims came across these different uh, works of architecture and art and carpets and all these different things, they took them up, but they had a kind of pivot on them. They pivoted them to make them fit within the kind of Quranic cosmology and worldview. So if you look at, for example, Sassanid or some of these other carpets, they're, they're much more figural representation. You see a lot of people, animals, and things like that. And then over time, uh, Persian carpets and things like that, the animals and people become more and more geometric and abstract uh, over time. Same thing with Turkish carpets as well. As the Turks became Muslim in Central Asia, the, the kind of figures, the tigers, and all this cool stuff on their carpets became more abstract. In Indonesia as well, too, there's some mihrabs with these like really cool dragons and stuff on it. And, uh, but over time, these things become flowers and arabesques and things like that. So they, they kind of get these different forms become integrated into the Quranic worldview and, and, and cosmology. Okay, just remains for me to uh, do a couple of thank yous. And obviously the first one is to Oled Amini. Thank, thank you, you for your great generosity in oh. answering all our questions and in giving us a, a truly enlightening and beautiful talk, oh, which you. fit so perfectly with the theme for the Hani and Najat Hassan lecture, which leads me to my second thank you, which is to Hani and to Najat. I'm sorry Najat could not be here. Please convey our, our uh, well wishes to her. And thank you so much for making today possible. Uh, quick shout out also to Jessica Shagrel, before I knock over the microphone, um, who made today possible in all sorts of practical ways. So thank you, Jessica. And thank you to you for joining us for the inaugural Hani and Najat Hassan lecture. It's not over. We have food. <laughs> and I'm, I think it's going to be beautiful and delicious. Yes. So please join us for some conversation and to continue the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was good. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.